Let's bring in Asmat Khan, the investigative reporter who's covered Afghanistan for years. Your response to President Biden to the um, complete chaos at the airport, the thousands of Afghans who are trying to leave, and the Taliban victory in uh, Afghanistan overall. So, President Biden really focused on the decision to end the war and not on that searing criticism of this withdrawal, the chaos we're seeing at the airport, the leaving behind of many people to whom the United States had made promises, people like translators, people like local journalists who were working with American journalists, uh, as well as activists who now face not just great uncertainty, like uh, like was earlier being talked about, um, but significant threats to their lives and safety. So none of that was really discussed in any detail. But I think another omission that really needs to be highlighted is the fact that President Biden took this negative view of Afghan security forces for, quote, not fighting. And that's not accurate. You know, as, as the earlier speaker was describing, many Afghan soldiers have died uh, fighting the Taliban over the last 20 years, countless, whereas uh, American soldiers since Operation Freedom Sentinel began in 2015, you know, we've lost 64 American soldiers in hostile deaths in Afghanistan. So there is a real disparity about who was paying the human costs of that fight, uh, at least from the side that's fighting the Taliban. Uh, but at the same time, what he didn't acknowledge was the fact that the entire way that those soldiers were doing that fight was with the support of U.S. air power. So the United States was bombing heavily parts of that country where there were fights against the Taliban raging. So just to give some context, in 2019, the United States dropped more bombs in Afghanistan than in any previous year of the war. So I think it was something close to more than 6,200 bombs that year as they were trying to negotiate. So even with incredible bombs dropping, you know, this was the deal they were able to get. And even then, look at how many Afghan soldiers were dying. Now, once you take that level of air power out of the mix, who would expect any Afghan soldiers to continue to fight? If that many Afghan soldiers died with the support of air power, what happens when you take that out of the mix? Now, on top of that, I just need to say, that that air power may have helped keep this tenuous hold that the Afghan government had on the country, but it also killed scores of civilians in rural areas, areas that don't often get talked about. Uh, nearly three quarters of Afghanistan is rural countryside. Uh, the majority of the population comes from these kinds of areas, populations that have seen the brunt of the war and we rarely hear about, and they've suffered not just bombings, airstrikes, and night raids, but also Taliban attacks. And many of them wanted this war to end. And you can't really talk about that air power and the tenuous grip that the government had without also acknowledging the ways in which that has created space for the Taliban, where even civilians who didn't like the Taliban just wanted the war to end. So it kind of makes sense once you take air power out of the mix that sort of tenuous hold falls. But at the same time, at this point, the Taliban has resuscitated itself and grown. You know, many of its more recent recruits were people who did lose loved ones uh, and, and really wanted revenge for those casualties. So it, in many ways, as surprising the swiftness of it was, uh, it, it also makes sense what we see happening right now. Mm. The Intercept reports that military stocks outperformed the stock market overall by 58 percent during the Afghanistan war, including Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics. Quote, from the perspective of some of the most powerful people in the U.S., the Afghanistan war may have been an extraordinary success. Notably, the boards of directors of all five military contractors include retired, top-level military officers. You have written extensively, extensively, uh, Asmat, about um, these contracts and who financially profited from this war. It's it's really stunning. It's it's incredibly stunning because people don't often talk about the massive wealth. Uh, the people who maybe went to Afghanistan temporarily got 
you know, hazard pay and built themselves homes. Uh, wealthy businessmen, military, former military officials who now, by the way, come on television talk shows to give their views without concealing necessarily their own, the fact that they're on boards of many of these defense contractors. Uh, so there has been incredible corruption on the part of many Americans, on the part of many uh, contractors, um, as well as just on the ground that has really helped to isolate local people from the Afghan government. And so just to give you some examples, you know, I spent a lot of time investigating U.S. funded schools in Afghanistan, something that we might consider the kind of untouchable success of the war, right? That in these 20 years, the United States has radically transformed education for Afghan children and in particular girls. And I really dug into the schools the United States had funded uh, and picked 50 of them in seven battlefield provinces and went to go see, well, you know, what's happening at these schools now? And when I would dig into it, I think 10 percent of the schools either were never built or no longer exist. A vast majority of them were falling apart. And then when I would try to understand what happened, you know, for example, in one case, there was a school that was missing. Turns out it was built in the village of a notorious Afghan police chief uh, who was allied with the United States, Abdul Razak, known for many human rights abuses. And the local education chief said, yes, you know, we built it here and there were no children in this village for three years. So nobody really attended. The school never opened for a number of years. In another instance, the school I w arrived at was empty, um, incomplete, never finished, and all the kids were across the street at a mosque having a religious education, not, uh, not the curriculum that they were on the books as recording having had. And when I tried to figure out what happened, it turned out the contract for the school went to the brother of the district governor, who then, you know, uh, pilfered the money, and it was never finished as a result of that. Uh, down the block in, in another part of Kandahar, uh, you know, the contract for a school was given to a notorious local warlord who's actually for the clinic that was going to be built next to the school, um, was given to this notorious warlord who basically wound up being the source for the rise of the Taliban in many ways. His family was part of that sort of corruption in the early years that preceded the Taliban uh, that really riled up individuals to support the Taliban because of the massive corruption and the human rights abuses that were happening to Afghan people. So even something as noble and as worthy of effort as education has been mired in these kinds of in this kind of corruption, this kind of wheeling and dealing. And if we had to understand why, I think it's the fact that counterterrorism goals were baked into every single aspect of the American project in Afghanistan. So even something great like schools you know, had these metrics, had this desire to imbue a counterterrorism narrative of some kind that left them willing to work with people who were abusive actors in the name of fighting terrorism, when in reality they often undercut Afghan people and a lot of the promises of the United States at almost every level. Asma Khan, I want to thank you for being with us and give um, Lieutenant Colonel Ann Wright the final word as you speak to us now from Honolulu, from Hawaii, uh, and you look at what's happening in Afghanistan, where you were almost two decades ago, what you think needs to happen and what you think Americans should understand about the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Well, I think that the U.S. public ought to be very wary of, of every uh, administration that thinks that we should take a military option in trying to resolve any sort of, of uh, conflict. Uh, we have seen that the United States and Vietnam and Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the lies that are told to us about why we need to go into countries with our military versus having some non-military resolution uh, to, these, uh, to these issues is really, really important, and particularly as we face our, our government right now that's, that's saying that China and Russia are our enemies that are threats to our national security. We, the, we, the U.S. people, have to push back against our government, against any more uh, military uh, invasions, occupations, attacks on any, any country. And 
My heart uh, goes out. It bleeds for the people of Afghanistan who have suffered through these decades long of, of uh, a war, uh, of violence. And I certainly hope that the next uh, years somehow calm down and that the Taliban takes a very different tack than what it had when it was in power from 1996 to 2001, because the people of Afghanistan deserve much better than what they have had. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. And, of course, we'll continue to cover this. I demoted you, Anne. Anne Wright is a retired U.S. Army colonel and former U.S. State Department official, who was part of the team that reopened the U.S. Embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, in December 2001. And Asma Khan, investigative reporter, contributing writer at The New York Times Magazine, will link to your articles, including the one you described, Ghost Students, Ghost Teachers, Ghost Schools. When we come back, we go to Haiti, where the tropical storm has slammed the same parts of the country shattered by the earthquake on Saturday that's killed more than 1,400 people. Stay with us.